Hey, Stephen Bonacore, the pod father of gaming here. And anybody who's ever listened to me talk about some of my favorite games, they've heard me pontificate about how great the War of the Ring is, right? It is my number one board game. I think it is a genius design. And of course, it is in my absolute favorite theme IP in the world, The Lord of the Rings. Last year, Ares Games, creator of the board game, came out also with a card game version, obviously called The War of the Ring, the card game. This was an Essen release. It was an immediate pickup for me. I played it a hundred times, love the game. Now, coming this Essen, maybe even a little bit earlier, maybe it'll make Gen Con, we're gonna have a solo slash cooperative expansion for War of the Ring, the card game. And I'm gonna give you an exclusive sort of overview of that game because I actually have the prototype for this game. Now, Roberta Demeglio of Ares Games, the president, at the UKGE gave me what he said was the only copy of the prototype in existence. Thank you, Roberto, for doing so. Of course, what I was gonna do was create a little video overview for him. We're not gonna play the game today. I am alone. I could play it in solo mode. But I'm not gonna play it here for you today. What I'm going to do instead is I'm gonna show you what's in the game, what are the changes to the game that you'll experience, and how this game is played as the free peoples against the bots playing the shadow. And that's the concept of this game. You are either playing solo or cooperatively with a friend as the shadow, I'm sorry, as the free peoples against the shadow player who are played by bots. And you can play it in both the trilogy mode and the dual mode. Let me take you to looking at this right now. So what do you get in War of the Ring, the card game against the Shadow expansion? Well, you're going to get two new decks of cards, one for Isengard, one for the Mordor player. These are the bot's new decks. You're going to get four new path cards. Each of these have something to do with what the Mordor or the Monstrous player, in the case of Doors of Doran, get to make it easier for the bots to make decisions, so to speak. You get two new Shadow Stronghold cards for Moranen and Minas Morgul, again, to make the decision that the Mordor player in both cases would have to make. The players make the decisions in the regular game. Here, the bot would just do what it says here. Makes it very, very simple. All of these changes just streamline how the bot will play the game. You get two of these flowchart cards on one side and summary of important rules changes on the other side. I'm going to show you, and, and of course you get the rule book. The rule book changes as you can see here, are extremely small. There are six, five pages of text, plus an expanded flow chart right here. I'm gonna grab one of these, and I'm gonna show it to you up close to show you what generally the, the bot is gonna do on its turn. And I'm going to bring in these rule changes that are on the other flow chart card, the back of, the, of this card as well. So, and it's the bot's turn, it's first going to think about using, use an action. Can the bot usefully resolve a use an action text on a card that's already in play? If the answer is no, that's the red, let me try to point, that's that red arrow, it would just go down to this section. If it does no use the action, it would then, can it pass? Uh, are other people above the carryover limit? Um, is the path number below the scenario's maximum? Sometimes the, the paths don't go to nine. Uh, and is the shadow winning every combat? Of all of these are yes, 
Okay, the bot just passes. If any of these are no, it goes down to this section, move. Can the bot move a card to a path or battleground where the shadow could conceivably win, but is currently losing? And I'm gonna talk about conceivably win in a second. And if the answer is yes, you move the rightmost card that is both eligible and useful from the reserve in this priority, first to a path, then to a battleground. Or it plays. You play a random card from the bot's hand, and because all cards in the bot's hand will be face down, you won't know what they are either, and play the card in this priority. An item to its wielder, to a path, to a battleground, to a reserve. And while this might look a little intimidating to begin with, I played the game proctored, I guess you can say, by Roberto at the UKGE, and I played it with Alex Schmidt, good friend uh, from Stonemaier Games, and we easily got through the game. We won it, which was kind of cool, but we easily got through it and understood exactly what was going on the whole time. So I'm gonna flip over now, or flip over to show you what these rule changes are and discuss them a little bit. The most important things are this concept of conceivably win and usefulness. So conceivably win. Think about this for a moment. If every shadow card in reserve that could move to that location did, would the shadow win the fight? That would mean it could conceivably win. And when determining this choice, you include the card being played as well. The shadow does not consider what free people's card could be moved to the location, nor the state of the combats at other paths or battlegrounds. So think about it for a second. I'm gonna bring out just bring out a, a battleground here. Here's Morani. Under normal circumstances, the shadow would not start playing cards here because it's already winning. Why should it? It's winning. Let's say for a moment that the free peoples brought out a strength of four here. Attack strength of four, and they're now winning. As we know, free peoples will attack here with their sword icons, and the shadow is defending here, and it already has two defense. If the shadow player was losing at this battlefield, it would start playing cards here to attempt to conceivably win. It would not look at what I have as the free people's player uh, in my reserve. It doesn't, of course, know it's in my hand. So it would say, I might be able to win this. So the bot would then start bringing cards to attempt to win. The same exact idea here at a path. Right now, ties would go to the free people. It would start trying to win this path if it could conceivably win it. That is the most important change to the game. Then we get into the concept of use, usefully. Is it useful? So if the shadow could say it is useful to, it is always useful, I should say, to add icons to a combat that the shadow would not win if the combat were resolved now, but could conceivably win, as we just talked about. It is useful to force the free people to forsake, eliminate, or cycle cards, to add corruption regardless of the cost, to draw cards, to play a card to reserve, or to play an item on a wielder. It's always useful to do these so the shadow would. It is not useful to do these things, to add more combat icons to a combat the shadow is already winning, right? Except on path nine, because you must win. It's going to do everything it can on path nine. To play or move a card with only leadership icons to a battleground, of course, because it, it, they will mean nothing. There has to be an army already there. So we'll, we'll move armies before it moves leaders. Makes sense. To activate a battleground that the shadow could not conceivably win, why would it bring a free people's battleground out if it couldn't conceivably win it based on what it has? Um, or to activate a path if the shadow would not win the resulting combat on the current path. However, it is not necessary for the shadow to be able to conceivably win the combat on the new path. So this idea of what is useful and what is not is very logical. 
And the idea of conceivably win something comes into play to say that, well, I'm going to continue playing to try to win this based on the fact that I could win it as the shadow bot if I do. Forsaking for the for the shadow is a little bit different as well. I apologize for the shake in my hand there. I'm going to try to hold this a little more st steadily. When, a, when the shadow has to forsa forsake, it will do so like this, and it's slightly different. It will first cycle the rightmost card from the reserve that it has. If that's not there, it will then cycle a random card from its hand. And if that's not available, it will then eliminate the top card from its draw deck. All right? Uh, so removing cards from the shadow's deck will become harder because much, much of the forsaking is cycle. There is also a change in playing. This is actually very important, and this is something you have to remember, but it's not too hard. After the first couple of plays, you'll get it. The bot does not cycle a card when playing a card, right? Everybody when knows that in this game, play a card, cycle a card, play a card, cycle a card, always. The bot never cycles unless it says something about cycling. Move. The shadow bot may move cards played to reserve during the same round. So that's a, that's a huge difference too. It's, the entire system is trying to ensure that the cards that the shadow get become useful and become useful quickly. There are a few other changes, but not necessary to go through. And again, this is a very, very simple change in streamlining to the current system that we know. There's also, of course, as in any cooperative type of game, there are difficulty modes, the standard and the challenging mode. Uh, and in the standard, in the standard mode, when you play, uh, each shadow bot draws one fewer card during the draw step than indicated by the scenario you're playing. Uh, but in challenging mode, the shadow bots draw the usual number of cards. So we played in standard mode because, well, first time playing against the shadow. Let me give you my final thoughts. Ah, uh, before the final thoughts, I wanted to show you a couple of the cards and maybe point out maybe some of the changes if I recall, because I'm not looking at the base game right now. So you'll notice that these cards are very familiar from the base game's Witch King deck, the Witch King himself. And he has a very similar effect. And in fact, I believe all of his icons uh, are exactly the same. Um, here's a, a Morgul Blade that has a slightly different effect, I'm pretty sure, uh, when played on a Nazgul, right? It's an item, Nazgul. Uh, you have a couple of choices that can be made here. Um, and Mordor Orcs. So most of the cards are either the same or very, very close to the same. Uh, they are just been tweaked. In fact, Roberto de Meglio told me that at one point they were thinking about only replacing some of the cards from the original base game, but instead decided to replace all of them to make it easy to go back and forth between the Against the Shadow expansion and the base game. So here's Saruman, right, from the Saruman deck, of course. Uh, his... His effect, I believe, is exactly the same uh, as it was. All of his icons and everything. His, wo his um, woven of all colors, I believe, is different. Take Saruman from the eliminated pile into the hand and add one corruption or forsake two cards and add two corruption. Maybe slightly different. And the Balrog, I love this card, uh, a little bit, I'm sorry, the same as far as I recall from the original. So you can see these cards are going to look certainly very similar, and play almost identical in all cases except where it makes it easier to play as the bot. Now, finally, the final thoughts. So that's a quick and dirty unboxing, explanation, overview, whatever you like to call this, of War of the Ring, the card game against the Shadow expansion. Unreleased, Possibly the only copy in existence here. Thank you again, Aries Games and Roberto, for letting me do this, for letting me take this home, show it off to people. I'm going to be playing it next week. I'm going on a cruise. I'm going to be playing with gamers next week. Going to be fantastic. 
Um, my final thoughts on this, and I'm not doing this because I love Roberto and Aries games, and I, I love this game. I mean, I love, of course, as everyone knows, War of the Ring, the board game, and it's still my favorite game, and this, is, this does not replace that game by any stretch of imagination. But this is a much faster play, um, a lighter play, an easier play, a fantastic game, and now I could play it solo, of course, or in this cooperative mode, which really played well, really played smoothly. Um, it literally was um, intuitive what the bots were gonna do each turn. You just follow the flow chart. And after a little while, you're like, okay, do, do they have as an, as an action card out? They'll do that first. Um, then they will go right down the spreadsheet. Uh, can they pass? No. Uh, is anybody else over a carry level? No. And they just go down the little list right there and they just do everything and it's simple and you you don't have to always make the bot make the perfect choice at least from the human being's perspective when it's at, when you have a choice to do one thing or another the bot could potentially play the way you wanted it to play is it the wrong way for the bot i mean because the humans are going to put some logic that they believe is right. I've played this game and I've said, well, the obvious move is is to do this, but that my, my opponent did something else. So there's a little bit of that, like, okay, well, I'll let it do that. Did I do it right for the bot or didn't I do it right for the bot? You probably will play it so that the bot is not 100% playing optimally as, as it is in the rules stated. The game plays smoothly. It's wonderful uh, to play with a friend. I have not tried it solo yet. But I can see this being a lot of fun just to bring the game out, throw these cards on the table, shuffle them up, and like, hey, let's play a game. And, you know, when you're playing it solo, you know exactly what to do. There's no decisions to discuss with your, with your, uh, with your friend across the table. So you'll play this game in under an hour, I think. Anyway, that's the overview of War of the Ring, the card game Against the Shadow by Ares Games. Check this out. Uh, it'll definitely be a Gen Con to check out. And of course, it'll be available for sale by Essen. This is going to be another winner uh, in this War of the Ring line. Thank you all for watching. I'm Stephen Bonacore, the Podfather of Gaming. I'll see you again soon.